Welcome to Chartwell Chats, a series of discussions over two years with leading historians and experts, which explores Sir Winston Churchill's relationship with Chartwell, not only through the property's collections, but also through historic moments in time. Chartwell Chats was developed and is jointly presented by the National Trust Chartwell and the International Churchill Society UK. We're working together to preserve the historic legacy of Sir Winston Churchill. We hope you enjoy it. Hello and welcome to Chartwell, to the first of our series of Chartwell Chats. Today we are going to be discussing Winston Churchill's purchase of Chartwell and we are marking the 100 year anniversary of that historic event. I'm here in the library at Chartwell and I'm joined by David Locke. David originally studied history at Oxford University and went into a career in finance after which he founded a private banking business specialising in estate planning, investments and tax affairs. He brilliantly made use of both of those skill sets and after a considerable period of research wrote the critically acclaimed No More Champagne, Churchill and His Money. So today we are going to be talking about how Churchill came to have this house. So David, just before we start with that, could you possibly introduce Churchill's situation with his finances before he saw Chartwell, on the eve of it, you could say. Well, uh, bef just before he, he uh, bought Chartwell, and you could say it's the only reason he could think of buying Chartwell, was that he didn't, for the first time in his life, he'd inherited some family money. And um, actually, it was two lots of it in 1921. He inherited first when there was a rather dramatic train crash in the north of Wales. Um, and on the train that crashed was a uh, Londonderry, an Irish cousin of his from the Londonderry family. And they shared a great-grandmother, the Marchioness, the former Marchioness of Londonderry. And she'd had some money of her own. So when she and her husband were making wills, her husband, of course, looked after the, their eld the, the, the estate, the London Dairy estate was going to the eldest son. So she thought, I'd better look after the other sons. And she left her estate in Ireland, in County Antrim, it's called the Garan Tower Estate, to, uh, f she had three sons of her own and a daughter. And it was to go down the sons in the order of seniority and any children they had and only if all of them failed to marry or have, have a son would it then go to her daughter who had married the Duke of Marlborough. And uh, it, one after the other, her sons died without children. And the final son died in this train crash, no children. So it jumped across to the um, the daughter's side of the family, uh, the daughter's first child, um, or at least her, um, uh, actually I should say her second son, but the, the first one who was in line for this, was uh, Lord Randolph Churchill, Winston Churchill's father. By then Lord Randolph had died, and so the money fell into Winston Churchill's hands. And it was, you know, it, it was, uh, after they'd sold everything up, he got a sum that was, after, and after paying tax, it was £55,000 in money of the day, the equivalent today of about £4 million. And he, suddenly he found himself with more money than he'd had before, and he bought his first country house. Sometimes people think Chartwell's his only country house, but in fact, he bought his first country house was Lullenden, not very far from here, half an hour down the road completely different from here in a way. Um, the house was much older, and it's right down at the bottom of a basin. Um, uh, the, the, whereas here at Chartwell, we're up on the top of a hill. So it, it couldn't be more different, but they loved London. The family was very happy there. And the only reason he sold it about two years after he bought it was that he'd run out of money. He couldn't keep up two places, London and the countryside. So that was, uh, he sold it in, at the end of 1919. And as I've explained, the inheritances came in 1921. Um, and so with this new money, one of the things he wanted to do was uh, 
was resuscitate this idea of a country seat. And why do you think, at that moment in time, of all the houses on the market, it was Chartwell that captured his mm. heart? Well, he had looked, he'd looked at, um, I mean, he told his estate agent, who was Sir Howard Frank of Knight Frank and Rutley, he told him that he really wanted to farm. You know, he had this, he, he, he loved animals, and he had this rather romantic idea of living off the land, um, something that horrified uh, Clementine. She never quite got used to this farming ambition. So he, uh, the f one of the first things that um, Howard Frank showed him was, was a farm in Buckinghamshire, but he didn't fancy that. Um, and then in the middle of 1921, uh, he showed him Chartwell. Uh, he said, it's, uh, you know, it's not a great house, but it's got 70 acres of grounds, it's got great views, go and have a look. So he had a look, and I don't think there's any doubt that what captured him was the, was the situation on top of the hill, the wheel stretching down, sea for miles. Presumably it was a nice day. <laughs> and, um, um, he liked it, and he said to Clementine, who was staying not that far away with other friends in, in Kent, you must come and have a look. And she came, and she loved it too, at first sight. She, um, she said it's, a, it's heavenly. And she, she was ready for what she called a little country basket. But she didn't like the farming bit. She just wanted the house, and that's what she said. I wish we could just have the house. Uh, and we don't really know why they didn't get it when it went to auction in uh, July or September 1921. I think the auction may have been in September. It was auctioned down the road in Tunbridge. We know the name of the pub. It was where the auction was held, but there's no records of the sale. But they didn't buy it. Nobody bought it. it didn't, presumably, it didn't hit the reserve price. Um, meanwhile, uh, Clementine was pushing a, a seaside home at Frinton in Essex, where she used to go for, take the children on holiday. Uh, Winston Lawney made sure he wasn't on the family holiday and would go down to France and see his mate, the Duke of Westminster, go to his country place, do some hunting, go to the casinos. Very different sort of holiday he had. But he did agree in uh, August 1922 to go and have a look at Frinton. Because Clementine had actually found a house. She said, you know, it's got 10 bedrooms, it's got lots of bathrooms, it's available for 4,000 pounds. I think it's great. Aunt Mary thinks it's great. You know, come and have a look. Um, and in fact, on set, you know, September the 12th, just two days before, um, he, he was shown Chartwell again and made his first offer on Chartwell. She'd found another house in Frinton and was still pushing Frinton. But he, as I say, his, his heart wasn't really in it. And um, on, uh, in the middle of September, uh, Howard Frank came to him because they, they had, another of his partners had the mandate to sell the house and said, um, we're going to go to market unless we sell it first, but you can have first refusal. I've negotiated that with my partner. You can have first refusal at a price of 5,500 pounds. And um, Ch Ch Churchill said, uh, he thought for about 48 hours, um, Clementine was by now in the very final stages of um, pregnancy with their fifth child, Mary. And um, so he didn't, he didn't consult her, which was later we discovered a, a bone of contention. Um, but he put in an offer for 4,800, so some way shy of the asking price. Um, anyway, at the meeting, the partner held firm. He said, no deal, sorry, we, we'll go forward to auction. But a day or so later, they agreed a price of 5,000 pounds. This house needed a lot of work. Can mm. you paint a picture of the condition of this <laughs> house upon them buying it? Well, he, I'm very, yes, there's, there, are some, um, uh, there are some records that exist from that time. It was a very different house. It, it faced north, I mean, or I, it f sort of northwest, I suppose. It faced the road. 
And one of the reasons that Clementine argued against it when they were well, in 1922 as opposed to 1921 was it was too close to the road, faced the wrong way, and uh, was very dark. So at, at the core of the house, there was this old, really quite old manor house. You, you know more about this than I do, but as I understand it, you know, the, the sort of what their architect described as the, the naked trunk of the house was, was really quite an old manor house. And we're in that part of the house we're now, in I should that, say. Aren't we? yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, but around the, 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 the um, Victorian owners had added on some pieces, particularly on the roadside. Um, and uh, so the whole sort of orientation of the house was to that side. Inside, the, they say that there was mould, very damp. Um, I mean, I don't think that the dry rot was visible, but there was dry rot. <laughs> Small rooms, no real entertaining rooms. I did once hear a story that the, um, the, the matriarch of the family who lived here before, the Cahoon family, used to have to when reading her newspapers in bed in the morning, do so under an umbrella <laughs> because there was that much water coming in from the ceiling. Yes. So it, it really was one of those houses where you think that view must have <laughs> been what sold it. absolutely yeah. been what sold yeah. it. And 70 acres, you know, the, which sort of played to his farming ambitions and there were, some, there were some sheep and there were some cows, a bit of dairy, and there were some chicken who produced some eggs. And he had this rather fanciful idea of living off the land. So... Putting it into context, the mm. Churchills have had this most extraordinary chain of luck that's led to this inheritance. Mm -hmm. Seen this house, fell in mm. love with it, but seen that it was hugely flawed as a building and as mm. a structure. But it's still on the market a year later, and they buy it. What happens next? Well, um, in, in, in the discussions with his bank before he actually bought it, he said, I'm going to do quite a lot of work to it. It, it needs work. So the purchase price was 5000 and he had, um, he did say to the bank, I'm going to spend about 8,000 on it, I reckon. And I should have a nice house, you know, fully done up to modern standards for 13,000 pounds total. And so he was very, I mean, as usual, quite um, impatient to get going. And uh, wanted to crack on. And the first thing was to hire an architect. Now, I mean, he ended up with a, with a man called Philip Tilden, who, who I think, did, you know, design-wise, did great things with the house. But he was a pretty young, inexperienced architect. And it, he was a surprising choice, in a way, because he was, a very op you know, he was the opposite of what Churchill as a person stood for. Um, Philip Tilden was a bit of an aesthete. He had, he had, during the war, been a conscientious objector and had gone down to Devon and you know, lived in a little community down there, didn't want anything to do with the war. So, you know, a surprising choice. Philip Tilden had come to his notice, I think, for two reasons. Um, first of all, he'd done quite a bit of work for um, Churchill's friend Philip Sassoon down at Port Lyme in Kent. Uh, there, there were mixed reviews of what he'd done down there. One, one critic called it a bit like a Spanish brothel. The other, the other person who um, Philip Tilden had worked for was Lloyd George, David Lloyd George. Good friend of Churchill's, of course, close colleague at this time. And he had built Lloyd George's house at Chert in Surrey. Um, he had apparently, I don't know that anybody told Churchill this yet, but he'd forgotten to put a scullery in. And, um, uh, you know, there were things like that would happen here. <laughs> but because Philip Tilden was a young, pretty inexperienced architect. And I think, you know, looking back, his skills were at design, really. Uh, they weren't so much at the practical end of managing builders or detail. Um, but n th at first, as they embarked, nobody appreciated that. And um, they had a very good relationship the first few months. Um, Churchill liked, they liked his core ideas for the house, which were to turn it around 180 degrees, strip it back to its naked trunk, turn it around 180 degrees to face the view, add a nursery wing, as they described it, up at um, 
the southern end, add what is now the eastern wing, which has the dining room and the drawing room and Lady Churchill's bedroom. And um, do a bit of work at the kitchen end. Uh, and importantly, flatten the side of the building that faces the road. Take off all these sort of extraneous porches and things and, and you will have a, a, f a flat um, face to the building, which helps the idea of turning it. Um, so all that was the big picture, and that they sort of pretty readily agreed on, I think. And um, the, the first sort of ideas, of course, came in within the 8,000 budget. In fact, um, Philip Tilden presented, maybe after talking to builders, a likely cost of £7,800. And in terms of that relationship between Winston Churchill and Philip Tilden, um, you rather tellingly said it was it was good for the first few months. I wonder if you might be able to outline how Churchill was as a client, because mm. the fact that he moves in down the road implies that he's not he's not a mm. distant client. No, <laughs> no, and, and I mean Philip Tilden wrote about this, you know, with the wisdom of hindsight, saying that uh, it was a very different relationship to the one he'd had with Lloyd George, who, ha who had basically let him get on with it. But um, that was not how it worked out with Winston Churchill. Um, in fact, soon after buying the house, uh, Churchill lost office and he decided to take Clementine and uh, they should go away and have a break in France. And off they went down to the south of France for a few months at the beginning of 1923. But he said, I'm going to keep coming, you know, I'll pay the occasional visit back and see how the work's going on. And so a pattern started to establish itself where he would come back. I suppose initially it was once every three weeks or so. And uh, he would um, buy a picnic and get in a car and come down and rendezvous down here with, um, with Philip Tilden. <laughs> and later he said, I, I now realise that every visit I made turned out to be a very expensive one for me because he, he kept changing his mind about what he wanted to do, basically. He added extra touches here. He said, let's have stone mullions around the windows. Let's have Gothic this or, you know, he kept changing the plans a bit. And every time it added a bit more cost. But, I, you know, that wasn't the only reason the cost started to mount quickly. I, th I think the fact is that um, Philip Tilden had not had a very thorough discussion with the builders and probably wasn't very uh, well informed on, uh, you know, costs of building and <laughs> the, the, for the finer practical points. And I don't think he'd ever worked with such a damp house. And, and he didn't really know how to cope with... Um, he didn't know about dry rot, basically, for example. So the costs started to, you know, they, they started to go up inexorably. And um, by March 1923, there are the first signs of cracks in the relationship <laughs> between um, owner and architect. And how does that manifest? Is that in correspondence? Is that in meetings in person where things become a little bit tense? Well, I, I guess a bit of both. But I mean, we can see it in the correspondence, mm -hmm. of course. You know, we don't know exactly went on in the, what went on in the buildings, but um, in, in the meetings. Uh, the, they, they took, the, the first part to be done was the nursery wing, and it was supposed to be ready by the end of March, 23. I mean, you know better than me how much extra they push that bit out. I, I mean, when they call it the nursery wing, um, what we describe as the nursery now is just a, a matter of a few feet wide, isn't it? And up above is um, Winston Churchill's bedroom. I mean, we're only talking about a, 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 a fairly small extension compared to the other one. You're, you're right in that it, it's, it's more the fact that that end of the building before was um, sort of clapboarded and part of the just different room configuration, whereas the formation of a wing is the idea of rooms on top of each other of relatively small dimension right. that was self-contained. Yeah. Um, but that, that wing especially 
even today, is something we have to be very mindful of in terms of the damp. So I can yeah. imagine buying a house in November yeah. with the unique conditions Chartwell has of the sheer exposure to the elements because mm. of that view, meaning that unfortunately it's completely mm. unshielded. Mm. And then as things progress, this house getting wetter and colder and suddenly yeah. kind of thinking, gosh, this, this isn't what I thought it was at the outset of this yeah. project. Well, the, the nursery wing, I mean, the, 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 the nursery wing was only a month late. They moved in in April. Mm -hmm. uh, rather famously, Clementine made sure she wasn't here the, the day they moved in. You know, she was absent, which was a sign of um, perhaps of her sort of fundamental view about the wisdom of the, the house, uh, buying the house. Um, uh, but they did subsequently have enormous weatherproofing problems at the nursery end. It kept coming through. There was a particularly problematic gable. They hadn't at first used proper uh, sort of weatherproofed membrane of any sort, although they tried later to add that, um, not very successfully. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, the bills were starting to go up. By the middle of 1923, Churchill was starting to get a bit worried. So very much so was Clementine. And she was obviously saying to him, you know, this is a disaster. You're, you're getting rid of our whole inheritance. And he, the, you know, he has to write to her and say, no, don't, you know, be patient, have courage. <laughs> and, um, but I, they, they also had to cut back, because of these rising costs, they did cut back the planned size of the... Um, the main wing that they were going to add, which technically points east, doesn't it? It's sort of east, south, southeast. So the one with the dining room and the drawing room and Lady Churchill's bedroom, which I think is the glory of the house, really, the entertaining rooms. But that was going to be 14 foot longer. So they would have been enormous rooms if they built out that size. And the plan was, in fact, that Lady Churchill, or Clementine as she then was, um, uh, would have a boudoir up there, not just a bedroom, but a boudoir as well. And that his bedroom, um, that Winston Churchill's bedroom would be in that wing as well. Oh, that's interesting. Yes. Yeah, the, the, you know, it was going to be, I mean, tw uh, an extra 14 foot, that's quite a, quite a distance. But that, they got, that got pruned back as, as costs started to go up. And, and that's why his bedroom finishes up over the, you know, in the nursery wing. And... Um, Clementine finishes up without a boudoir. <laughs> and the drawing room and the dining room are smaller than they might otherwise have been. I mean, actually, I think they're fine. In terms of once they've moved in, once those teething problems of the building start to resolve themselves, how does life play out for the churchills mm. once they're here? Well, I mean, their older children were sort of 10, 11, you know, they were 12, and, and Mary had was still tiny. Um, so it, it was a house for a young family, uh, but a young family who ha were used to having people coming in and out of and being hospitable, and, um, but not great big sort of formal society entertaining. So it is, uh, and I think that's the strength of it as a house, is, is as a family house, and that's how you show it, isn't it, as, as it was sort of in the 1930s. I, I, I was thinking as I came here today, and today the weather's been pouring all day, that if you'd shown it as it was in the 1920s, you really ought, even today, to have water pouring down the walls. <laughs> and also, and this was, another, this, this was another dividend of all the building work. I mean, it, it was not done to a great standard. They had frequent plaster falls from the ceilings, and they lost two chandeliers fell. Uh, quite expensive chandeliers, you know, Country Churchill complained to, in, in the increasingly acrimonious correspondence with um, Philip Tilden and then with his independently retained surveyor as they started to get quite formal, this disagreement, and then finally with his solicitors, you know, he, he, he ran through this category of things that had gone wrong throughout the 1920s, basically, and, and one of them was a chandelier that had fallen costing 40 pounds, which I suppose in today, you know, we're talking 3,000 pound chandelier had f fallen and shattered. So he tried to pin that to Tilden too. <laughs> and thinking about numbers in terms of, of the money, so buying a house for 5,000, budgeting eight on making it inhabitable yeah. and ready to move in, yeah. 
how does it actually turn out? It, well, so that's 13,000, yes. right? It turns out at, well, th like for like, it turns out at 30,000. 13 becomes 30. Um, but then, and I, uh, he gave, as far as I can make out, he transferred at least another 10,300 10, to Clementine for furnishings, soft furnishings. So really, it was a £40,000 project so against what he had told himself and his bankers was going to be a £13,000 project. And at one point, he, you know, when Clementine was saying, what on earth are we up to? He said, well, look, I'm, I'm going to get Sir Howard Frank to come in and do a valuation. And this was fairly early days. He said, I can guarantee you he's going to come up with at least 15,000. And we were, by then, he knew they were putting in 20. But he said, it'll be worth at least 15. And, you know, it's our home. You don't always make purely economic decisions about your home. Please, you know, have courage, be of goodwill. And... Um, so, so how he came along and said, 12. And that, that, that was a bad moment. Um, the, and uh, the house, you know, during the 1930s, uh, as you know, they had a lot of financial problems, really one after the other, and their debts were mounting. And it got to the point where uh, really the only solution seemed to be to sell Chartwell. And, um, of course, Vincent Churchill was very reluctant to do that because he, he loved it as a home. He loved it and he put so much into it. But he agreed that it did seem to be the only way out. But he, he insisted he would only do it if he got a fancy price. And, and he was looking for 30,000. But, you know, it was quite obvious they couldn't get that and he brought it down to 25,000. And then, as, as the pressures grew on his finances towards the end of the 1930s, he actually he said to um, the people trying to sell it, well, don't tell anybody, but I, I would accept 20,000. So, you know, he knew... I mean, you bear, bear in mind, this is against the backdrop of depression. And things, so it's, you know... Um, I'm not saying he was a... He'd made foolish decisions all along the way, because it, it was a great... Um, it was a great home, and, and the, background, the economic background was difficult. But they couldn't, the fact is, they couldn't sell it at £20,000 before, before 1939. They tried, but they couldn't. So at that point, there are in correspondences between Winston and Clementine, shall we move into one of the cottages maybe for a time? Shall we, you know, dust sheet the main house? So yep. they are looking at ways of economising at the same mm. time as not being able to sell it, aren't they? Mm. They'd often th they'd, they'd thought even as early as 19, in the, the sort of later 1920s of renting the house out for the summer, um, of shutting it during the winter because it was very expensive to heat. Yeah. And um, the, the, there was a bit of that, it did happen in the late 1930s. But I mean, Mar Mary, his daughter, says it was never. No, she didn't really detect it, and she was. Uh, they, she didn't detect too much of the economising. She was in her sort of late teens, maybe there by then. Um, but yes, they had to cut back the way they looked after guests. You know, they cut out the fish dish. Um, no cream is to be served, Churchill said. And then he. And then there was this famous sort of edict: uh, no more champagne is to be served to guests. From which the title of my book, "No More Champagne," is taken. But he, so this was just before the sort of big implosion of his finances. Uh, late 1937, he sent out this note saying, "No more champagne is to be served to guests." But he was to get an imperial pint a day. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. And I should say, with your book, one of the things I love most is how throughout all the chapters you compare to sort of a, an approximation of current values. So you can equate um, roughly... At the, the top of the page. Yeah, yes. exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So you have a quick go-to yeah. to work out yeah. how much Inflation how much and was exchange rates, in. yeah. That's exactly. Right. Yeah. Um, thinking about that time in the late 30s when they're looking to sell, how... How much of a knife edge are the Churchills on financially at that point? I mean, he'd been trying throughout the 1930s to rescue the position in which he'd found himself at the end of the 1920s. It, it, you know, during the 1920s, he went through his inheritance, basically. This inheritance I was talking about through, from the Irish side. 
and to a certain extent his mother's money. He lost it, and you know, a combination of unsuccessful stock market investing, um, uh, gambling, and Chartwell costs of building this. And, and so by 1929, it was basically gone. But he had a good book contract as he lost office in 1929 to write the book on his um, ancestor, John Judah Marlborough. Uh, and he thought he'd go over to America for a few months. Same sort of routine, you lose office, you go and rejuvenate. But his agent said, his book agent, an American, Curtis Brown, said, don't go down to France again. You know, Go to America, that's where the future is going to be. And so off he went to America, all expenses paid by hosts dotted around the place. But it was the end of a big bull market in shares, and he got sort of sucked into the last stages of that. And then came the crash, actually, while he was in New York. And he lost today's equivalent of almost a million pounds. And so the 1930s, the story of the 1930s, the wilderness years, is really a constant writing of newspaper articles, books, you know, that's what that factory next door, the new secretary's room you've ended up here, opened up here, was all about. I mean, he had, most of the time, he had um, two secretaries on duty the whole time, dictating to one, the other was typing up. You know, one shift finishes, another takes over. And he was churning out articles and books to try to stem this rising tide of debt or even reverse it. He was also investing uh, when he, well, he was dealing in currency options, currency forwards. I uh, could never stop himself going once a year down to the, or twice a year down to the casinos in France. And he, he used to lose, in today's money, about sort of 50 to 100,000 pounds a year uh, doing that. Um, financially, actually, the war had transformed his finances. Um, because not only did what he had formerly written become very resellable, because he was now the man who had stood against Hitler and um, stood against the defeat of the Western world and liberalism. So everybody wanted to read what he'd written before. Uh, but also they, uh, the, the film industry wanted to make use of the books he'd written before and make them into films particularly his autobiography, My Early Life. And so during the war, um, he, he actually, in the, during the war and immediately after the war, he sold s book rights to seven, uh, film rights to seven of his books. And some of them for, you know, large amounts of money. I mean, um, in today's money, about uh, two million each. And the other thing was that at the time of, 95% um, tax rates, he um, had engineered or thought he had engineered a, a um, regime under which these would not be taxable. And, and in fact, none of his earnings, uh, other than his um, prime minister's salary, he thought should be subject to tax. I have to say the Inland Revenue disagreed, that's the taxation authority here, and uh, they did assess him to tax on his um, reprinted articles, etc. Um, but some of his advisors said to him, we think it's worth challenging them. And um, it took Churchill quite a, quite a little while to decide whether it was an appropriate for a sitting prime minister in the middle of the war to challenge the inland revenue. But, you know, his finances were still very stretched at the time, and there was a lot of money at stake. The difference between keeping 6p in the pound as it then was, i.e. 5% or, or 100%. And um, he decided to go for it, and he, he mounted a challenge to the inland revenue. And um, the first stage of these sort of challenges is heard by a tribunal formed of laymen, as solicitors or you know, sort of professional people. And I think, I think um, Winston Churchill's calculation was that a, a body of laymen like that would probably find for him you know, in his favor. And, and that's exactly what happened. They found in his favor. And at that, that stage was all private, which is the only reason that Churchill had embarked down it. The next stage was the, the inland revenue had to decide whether to go to a, what's called a special tribunal and 
appeal it, basically, at which point it would become public. So well, the church was taking the risk that if the Inland Revenue did appeal, it would all become public knowledge. Um, uh, but in fact, the chairman of the Inland Revenue, a man called Sir Cornelius Grigg at the time, uh, told his senior people, his senior people said, you must, we've got to appeal. He's riding coach and horses through us here. Um, you must, we must appeal, otherwise the whole system's going to. But the, the chairman went away for 24 hours, came back, and he wrote them a one-word memo. I think the best memo I read in all my research for, on this subject. And his one-word memo, which is in a file in the National Archives, simply says, acquiesce. <laughs> and, um, so they decided not to appeal, and uh, Churchill had his way, and from then on he didn't basically declare any of these sort of earnings on his tax form. They came back in the summer of 1945, and th then there is this idea flying around of selling Chartwell. But you... you well, I'm saying, I mean, I think, I think what happened, Catherine, is that um, he was a bit down in the dumps. He was, you know, at the end of the war, because he'd just been unseated. He, you know, uh, he'd lost his, the Conservatives had lost the election big time in July at the end of the war, which seemed like uh, a huge, almost a dagger in the heart, the man who'd put so much into winning it. Um, and uh, the Russians were trampling all over Central Europe, and he saw that as a real threat. And he, he he fe he was he was a bit depressed, you know. He he was a bit down, and he undoubtedly said to uh, his friend Lord Camrose, who by then was his sort of main financial fixer, Brendan Brackener, having said, "I must get on with something else in my life." <laughs> um, he said to Camrose at some point, "You know, I'm not sure whether I'm going to be able to continue at Charwell." It was a sort of throwaway line, I think, a bit depressed. But but Camrose treated it as a real risk and he thought this is ridiculous you know here's this guy who has led us to victory put everything into it um, in the old days even as up to the end of the first world war they used to reward victorious generals with huge prizes large sums of money but um, not prime ministers and there was no question of that sort of reward at the end of the second world war so i i, I think cameras thought we must do something about this and and he conceived the idea of making an offer to buy Chartwell so that the Churchills could stay here. And they could stay here for the rest of their life. They could live, um, they'd still have to be responsible for stuff that went on in the building, but all the external stuff would be um, taken care of. Uh, and, and, and basically the property would become owned by the National Trust. If they bought it, they would hand it over to the National Trust. So he. He went around, um, Lord Camrose said, I'll put in the first dollop. Um, and uh, he went round the sort of chairman of the Merchant Bank. He went the, his next stop was the, was the chairman of the Bank of England. And uh, he got him on side. And then so with that, he was able to go around the chairman of all the big banks and say, you know, the chairman of the Bank of England has done this. What about you? Are you in? And then, and, and he moved out, um, and uh, he had no difficulty in putting together. In, in the end, he, um, uh, they, they paid 50,000 for the house, didn't they? So the house had failed to sell at 20,000 in 1938, but they said, here's 50,000. And then they raised more money, about another 35 or 40,000 for an endowment to help with the running costs. I think they raised over 90,000 in the end. Um, and they presented it to him just before Christmas. And I think by then Churchill's spirits were much revived actually. You know, he'd been painting with General Alexander on the age of Lake Como. That, that did him a lot of good. And, um, he, you know, he was a resilient character. He, he was much revived and he, he heard of this offer and he thought that's a really great offer, <laughs> you know, at every level, at every level, including the financial level. Here's this thing, I failed to sell it for 20,000 10 years ago, and we've had a war which, which hasn't done property prices that much good, and they're, they're offering me 50,000 and I can live here and they're going to look after the outside. I mean, you know, what's not to like about it? <laughs>
Um, so he didn't need it, but he, liked, he appreciated it. It was a great offer. Given the importance of Chartwell to not just Winston Churchill, but to his, his family and his, his career and so much beyond the walls of this house, how would you summarise the importance of that moment a hundred years ago where this house became his? Well, I, th I think it did turn out to be one of the great turning points in his life in that he, he was able to put down these roots. He was a very restless man. You know, he had uh, all this energy. Um, he needed to put down roots somewhere, and this is where he put down the roots. And um, it gave, it was one of the few things that was really sort of a solid foundation through all the vicissitudes of the next 20, 30, 40 years. Chartwell, you know, if you look for things that were solid and always there, well, Clementine is one, apart from when she went off for six months on these sort of cruises to the, you know, to the East Indies and things. But, but um, yes, Clementine and, uh, and Chartwell are the two sort of solid pillars on which he was able to depend, I think. I can't think of a better note to end on. Thank you so much, David. It's been an absolute pleasure chatting to you today. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Good. Thank you, Catherine.